Welcome everyone to the last <laughs> of the Wheel of Life talks on that tanka called the Wheel of Life. And thank you for coming. Um, we're going to do the, if you've been here before, we're going to do the usual. If you haven't been here before, welcome. Yeah. All that crazy stuff yeah, we were doing. It's just really to uh, check our motivation to get some humility and to consider the specialness of what we're doing in the next couple of hours. We're going to spend hopefully two hours um, shifting the way we think about things for a little bit. So when we go back out into the crazy world that smacks us in the face with happinesses that then are not so happy and then <laughs> it smacks us with more happinesses to mask that unhappinesses is from before <laughs> that we, then we go and grab some more happinesses. Um, we at least have some training or some thought about where these things come from for us particularly. Um, so we're going to uh, talk about that today and usually we start by considering, I mean you all probably had a heavy work day or something happened to you today. Something, um, it's a strange day today, it was a funny day last night. Or something. So your mind is probably doing this. So we're going to go into from reverse to neutral. Give yourself time. Give yourself time to think and get your mind in the ideal place. I mean, if you had a choice and you do today, where would you put your mind? Yeah. Would it be the way God um, interacted with today, or would it be a little better? So let's see if we can go from that. To a little better. We'll call that neutral and then we'll start. So to do that we do a couple of things. We're going to do this mandala offering and it means absolutely nothing <laughs> unless <laughs> you think about something. You know, it really is just sounds. Blah, blah, blah. Um, these are special sounds that have been used for thousands of years and the idea behind these sounds are if you can transform your every experience into ultimate bliss where there is not a single speck of unhappiness in everything you perceive, meaning the universe, everything you conceive of, meaning the universe. If there's not a speck of unhappiness anywhere in there and instead a shower of bliss for everything you perceive, that's what you're doing by doing this, the four corners of the universe, yeah, the center where you are. Okay, so you, the idea is you think about that while you go blah blah, and then um, that starts getting your mind. See, there's no magic in it. The magic is in your mind. So you start getting your mind to that place, and then after that, we're going to do some more blah blah, <laughs> and we're going to uh, think about what can really help us. The next blah blah is about. There's some things that can help us get better and happier, ultimately. And there's some things that don't. The next blah blah is about whatever those things are. And if you're a practicing Buddhist, you know, they've got terms and whatever, but there is something and that you take refuge in that really does help you. So while the next blah blah, we do three times. And that's again to get your mind into thinking. The intention is what matters. Your mind into thinking, what if I had faith again, hope again, possibilities again, logic again, that I could fix the stuff that's broken? And I don't mean the big stuff, I mean the little stuff. So I wanted to highlight that because it can become so habitual. Our minds just go, oh yeah, I know that, blah, blah. Yeah? So please do nice blah, blah. Okay. <laughs> um, Sam? <coughs> Sashi Pukijishin et Tautram Virablin Shin Yendem Padi Sangashin Dumite Vuadi Drogun Nondashin Bardu, Dakni, Yamsuji, 
of the air moving in and out of our nostrils that way. And as soon as our mind, the monkey mind we talked about, starts throwing us ideas or thoughts, we'll come back to the breath and start counting from one again. Try and get up to five or ten. We'll do this for a couple of minutes. sense of closeness between you. It's just you feel their presence if you can't imagine their face or their body. Try and develop a sensation that you're sitting in front of someone and you feel their gravity. Now bow down to them humbly. They are the most perfect aspect of you. Hope that you can become that. 
and offer them something beautiful, heartfelt, whether it's something wonderful you've done, some hope that you've moved towards, or some goodness you've done to another person or people, some purity, offer that to them, or imagine the most fantastic scenery, the most beautiful flowers, whatever it is, and then multiply them by zillions covering the whole of space and offer that to them. Now, don't be shy, this is just in your mind. You're creating imprints. Turn up the colors. Turn up the spaces. Turn up the sensations. accept it happily. Now with this closeness, you're going to talk with them about something you did today, something you regret, something that didn't turn out well, some mistake, some hurt, some negativity in your life that you created, even if it was just a negative reaction towards something. And talk with them about it, generating a genuine sense of regret. If the idea of karma is true, then you've just harmed yourself by reacting negatively towards someone, hurting someone. Feel the regret in your heart and watch them understand because they've evolved from that to what you imagine they understand. And make some kind of commitment that for a time you'll try not to do that action again. that you can fix it by not doing it again and in fact by doing something precious in the next day or hour or a few minutes depending if it was a thought or an action. Make a commitment that you do something to fix that even if it's apology. Now we'll do the opposite to that. Imagine the most precious thing you've done today, the clearest thought, the most open-hearted action, the most correct view, the tiniest thing or the largest thing that touched somebody so much that you know it will impact them positively, you've done some goodness, it's in your mind and it's in the world that you perceive let it grow. Rejoice in that, feel that sense of awe and wonder if that thing were to grow and multiply. You've done goodness. Sit with that feeling for a bit. Connect with that being in front of you, they also know that. Be specific about the action. Now imagine that just like you, there are countless beings on this planet, as rare as it is, but there are, who have done a similar goodness or a greater one, who are trying to move to a place where they themselves create a place that is full of goodness and happiness, there's no more burning. There's no suffering. Today, people meditating, taking action, correcting wrongs, healing people, hugging people. Feel a sense of joy for them. Be 
be happy for them. They are evolving. Wish that they could do more. Now amplify that feeling without being in front of you. Let it grow. Don't be afraid. Now connect with that being's eyes and in your intent ask them to please teach you through every single action that happens with you, to you, for you in the next day, in the next month, in the next year. That every circumstance you face can be for you a lesson, an opportunity to grow, that you may see it in a precious way. That intent is you, it's possible. Ask them to help you and guide you. So at every turn you're growing, evolving. Watch them agree and smile back at you. It's possible. It's possible to stop hurting. Ask them to please stay. This being in front of you and what they represent. Ask them to please stay until you reach a place where you are like them. It's possible. Don't be afraid of that sensation. Let it sit with you in your heart. It is of you. It is your making. And watch that being rise and land on top of your head and shrink, sitting right above the crown of your head. And as they get smaller and smaller, sitting there, you feel their gravity and their presence above you. They're made of light, feel that sensation of light, that warmth at the top of your head, at the crown of your head, and all they represent sitting there for the entirety of the class and beyond. So welcome all the people. You're really far away today. <laughs> We're going there. Um, do we have any questions before we get started? Thank you. That's fine. <laughs> Okay, can we remember where we were last week? Can you remember the last thing we did last week? To me, that was special. Did anyone remember? The bardo. Mm -hmm. We talked about the bardo. Yeah, what's the bardo? Mm -hmm. The liminal space. Yeah, it's the intermediate stage between life and death, conceptually. Yeah, it's actually, you get a bardo body and you get issued. It's like you go into the lottery ball thing, yeah. And as you spin in the bardo, you go up the white part, down the black part. As you have these hallucinations, and your elevator gets off wherever your projecting karma drops you. Do you remember that? Link 10. Okay. Um, does, is everybody warm or cool? 
Yeah, maybe some fans. Can we uh, try not to do that? Yeah, I want. Yeah. Would you want fan or aircon? Or both? Fan's good. Fan's good? Okay, I'm a little warm here. Here we go. Um, I'm going to try and rush through the stuff that we haven't covered yet on the Wheel of Life today. We're going to uh, look again at some of the things that were most important, but towards the end, I'm going to spend more time than anything on that caption at the bottom of the Wheel of Life, which is in the one behind you, um, and what that means, because that's the instruction manual for this painting, and it's got some important stuff. So last time we were talking about karma, how every action we do, every single thing we do, is collected, it's recorded like a camera, your mind, yeah? And they say that every finger snap or millisecond you collect 65 of these and experience 65 of them at the same time, yeah? There's a karma ripening, there's a karma planting, same time. It's actually the same thing. That gets a little confusing. So you're witnessing something arising in front of you, you're witnessing your emotion or your response to it, yeah? And the obvious connection there is the your, your experiencing, your responding. So they're both, uh, once a karma ripening, once a karma planting to explain it in this way. But they sit there laden like a ton of seeds, yeah, sesame seeds, being collected in your mind or movements in that glass. Remember we talked about your mind might be this clear glass, this absolutely clear thing. And every response, you dent it a little bit. You might dent it with some negative intention or some positive intention. 90% of karma is your intention behind an action. Cutting a skin isn't in and of itself a bad thing. Yeah, so someone cuts my skin with a knife. Is that good or bad? The cutting of the skin with a knife. Bad. bad, right? Like we think it's bad. I think it's bad. Don't do it. Don't want to do it. But if a snake bit me, you know, and there's poison there, and cut, getting that out would be cutting my knife in, all of a sudden it's a goodness, you know, please cut it quickly. So the, the cutting is, is nothing, yeah? So, and in fact, I, you see this with athletes, you know, who get bashed up and, you know, I've seen it with Australian football players, we, we play real footy, <laughs> you guys wear all this padding like girls, you know, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you know, yeah. people come smashed up from Aussie rules and you know, footy in Australia. And I've seen guys get smashed up and then they go, wow, that's awesome. And then they go and charge some more, you know? Whereas if you did it to me, because I'm a big wuss, I'd be like, oh, stop hurting. <laughs> <laughs> so karmas are planted 65 millisecond of finger snap. And they, where do you think they go? Where do you think they stay? In the kimchi. <laughs> yeah. It's you, yeah? It's it's your mind. They're not out there somewhere in some place. <laughs> and then all these other stuff happens and then we talked about how just before death, yeah, one of these karmas in one of the explanations, at link ten, the pregnant woman, the right egg, yeah. Uh becomes the basis for your continuum of your future life. Yeah, so there was one karma that made you human. And then a ton of L2 karmas also charged up, but not as not the projecting karma, which fills in the detail. You know, for me, blonde, tall, beautiful. <laughs> Blue eyed, Blue -eyed. Blue -eyed. <laughs> sorry, I forgot the yeah. Healthy head of hair. <laughs> um, so there's uh, one projecting karma, and it seemed really unfair, right? Like it seemed like <laughs> all that work that you put into great practice, you know? Because then the the the, the book by Pavanka Rinpoche we talked about last week, the three volumes of Pavanka Rinpoche's liberation thrust in the palm of your hand said that, you know, even if you've been the best practitioner, kept all your vows and done all the best morality, um, a moment of anger at this time can get the wrong uh, karma. <laughs> that, um, 
throws you into a hell realm or an animal realm or some other realm of existence. We'll talk about getting over there. It sounds, um, the language for this stuff is weird, you know, because we have to talk about it nominally and talk about it ultimately. It's interesting. So one karma projects your next life. The next, um, the next, there are a bunch of L2 karmas or other karmas who are we're also charged up. Charged up by what mainly out of all these other links? Do you remember what mostly charged them up? Because these karmas are just latent there. Yeah, in the Buddhist point of view, that you could have Aryas. Well, Walk, walking around, our, our hearts walking around, who have had the experience of seeing emptiness directly, they've still got a bunch of latent karmas that aren't popping off into suffering. Yeah? So, what have they done? They've stopped something in between L2 and L10, link 10. Is what a feeling? Uh, it's actually the thing that the feeling produces. Desire. Good, good. Hmm? Desire. Good. Initial desire and then craving. Yeah? Links right. 8 and link 9. They're called the nasties. nasties. Yeah, nasties. good. Nasties. good. <laughs> so that is what charges them up. Yeah? These are, uh, and then everything here, because it starts from link 1, which is. Link 1 is. Ignorance. Thank you. Everything is laden with ignorance. Ignorance of what? Where things are coming from. Not knowing where things really come from, right? So, for this reason, and you know, we, we can't in six weeks cover the entire canon of Buddhist thought that takes people 12 to 20 years to understand these things. This is a summary of these things. All of this, dependent origination, ignorance, desire, craving, intent, living, death, all these other things, you could spend such a long time investigating until you get a realization on how to make it applicable because it doesn't mean anything if you can't change some of the daily sufferings that we're experiencing and by sufferings this is everything within that wheel is suffering um, I, I don't mean gross suffering of oh my god my arm got chopped off today yeah or I had a most horrible experience today I don't mean those I mean the tiny, tiny disappointments that grow into those things later. The idea of karma's right. So, because link 10 is very important, a bunch of things happen. Um, you need to be able to think clearly at the moment of death. We talked about, and we don't like talking about it in the West, and I feel, so I want to shy away, I don't want to talk about it too much, but we don't give it enough notice in the West. We will, if we're just normal human beings and animals and insects and the rest of the things in this planet that we can see and some that we can't will have to come to a point where we are going to die and at that point hardly any of the things we've ever done will matter hardly any like, did I really choose the right ice cream the other day? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Was that career path just the right one for me? Yeah? Did I trek correctly through Nepal? You know? Or did I wear bad footwear? <laughs> you know, your mind focuses on these crazy things. I mean, how many things has your mind focused on today? How many of them were really... Um, meaningful for you. If any one of them can pop up at the moment of death, if those things, and they grow, every motivation you've had today, I want the car, I want the ice cream, I didn't want the boy to do that, I want the boy to do this, I didn't want that girl to look that way, I didn't like the siren on the street, the stupid siren, someone dying in the siren, you know, mm -hmm. and all these people are yelling at the siren, just walking over here. They're like, okay, we know you're dead or something. You know, like someone said that to the siren. I'm like, you're just walking the street at Union Square. You know, and there's this disturbance in your mind. Yeah, the disturbance starts by experiencing the siren <laughs> as a bad thing. The person inside the box is probably feeling it's a good sound as it came to help them. Um, so because of 
LinkedIn being so important, if this is true, and I'm not asking you to believe it on faith, in fact, that for all of these things, they mean nothing. If you sit here and go, oh, I believe it, fantastic, then it's not going to work. It can't work. You have to put it into your DNA through analysis and investigation. The Buddha said, don't listen to me. You figure it out. Don't follow me with faith. These are ideas about how the world functions, your world. They're deeper than the Large Hedron Collider and other investigations into the physical world. They're helpful. They're fantastic. They're one of the three ways of looking at dependent origination. Remember those? Big test. What are the three ways that dependent origination, which is the re, uh, three explanations? Things come from... Dependent origination means everything we experience pop up or we experience them, they depend on something. They originate because something made them originate. They're dependent on something. So things are dependent origination because they depend on their parts. Their parts, yeah. And from the Western scientific point of view, you can get the parts down to atoms, you know. The top part, the bottom part, the left part, the, the molecular structure, they're just parts. I'm um, just really a series of atoms. Yeah, you can get it that way. So that thinking happened two and a half thousand years ago. They just didn't call it atoms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they go to the tiniest part, and you find the tiniest atom, and then you go well to the left of the atom and to the right of the atom. You can divide it into, and then you can divide the left part to you know another tiny part, and so on. And you can do an infinite regression until your mind freaks out a little bit and touches this bigger spectrum we've been talking about, the real nature behind stuff. Yeah? And that has something to do with you, the viewer, the being interacting with the thing, with the atom. So that's good. It helps us to some degree. You know? We actually use it for judgment all the time. You know? You like boys? There's some atoms. You like girls? There's some atoms. You like roses? There's some atoms. You know, you like daffodils? There's some atoms. <laughs> you know? And then you can, uh, you, we make judgments on those so what's the next uh, dependent origination? Explanation. They depend on their causes. Things are caused. That's a little bit more advanced thinking. It covers a few more phenomena in the world. It really just helps philosophers more than anyone else. You know, um, The people that really try to think deeply about where things come from, that's a little bit more all-encompassing. Because it doesn't just say, it agrees that there are parts, that things are dependent on their causes, then gets a little bit more complicated and it takes a lot more brain power to think about the real causes of a tree. You know, it's not just the seed, there's all these other causes, there's the secondary causes. Just like I was explaining the uh, L link 10, the penjaculate projects your human life span, your idea that you're this thing for an entire life. So there's one karma for that one idea, that one continuum. That's the main cause. And then there's the secondary causes. You know, you need a mum, you need a dad, you need to be in Africa or in China or in Australia or wherever. There's other things that need to happen for you to eat and, you know, you need organs and the rest. A pen, we talked about the pen, the course, uh, the causes of a pen would be the plastic that it came, some heat, the designs, all these other courses. It lets you investigate to much more depth why things come up. But it still doesn't explain everything. There's some holes to reality because when you apply that thinking and you try and say, okay, so I know exactly where pens come from, and I know exactly where boys come from, and where the girls come from, and the rest, it still doesn't make everything work. Things still break down and we can't figure out their causes. We think we've figured out their causes. We know what produces money. Work, hard work. Mm -hmm. Education, good education produces money. Yeah? We think we know. It's caused by going to university, getting a good job, and they give you tons of cash. The hacker mm -hmm. doesn't always do that. <laughs> <laughs> I never did it in the first place. You know? <laughs> However, that's the main convention we live in. There's something to that. That doesn't mean that that is not 
correct 80% of the time. So maybe it works 90% of the time. Maybe it works 99% of the time. If it works 99% of the time, it doesn't work. It's not the cause. It can't be the cause if it works 99% of the time. Because a cause must produce the result how many times? Always. Always. So then there is something else. And look, if you can, there's another analogy. Um, it's like peeling layers of uh, gauze from your eyes. Imagine you've got 10 layers of gauze covering your understanding of this world we're in. And each time you get a bit of wisdom, so things depend on their parts, you've peeled off one of those layers. You've got a better understanding. Oh, I can figure out how things work. Yeah? Things come from doing other things. I've peeled some other but They work. They function. They help you. But then still things turn to mush. So then we can't figure out how things function all the time. So there's more to it. So this presentation is trying to get to that beyond the nominal way. So the ultimate understanding of dependent origination, things pop up, they originate because they depend on their... <laughs> Your perception, good, name or label, yeah? When you apply that explanation to dependent origination, it introduces you as the viewer and everything can be explained. And it takes time because we are not brought up to think that way. Yeah? Not only that, but we now have limitations that it doesn't quite match the narrow part of the spectrum we're looking at life through. And by that I mean being human is one broadness of the spectrum then within that human, we've got limitations on our senses, the six doors by which we interpret the things that pop up in front of us, the sounds, the smells, the touches, the tastes, and the rest. We think we know where we stand. We think we know the house we live in. We think we know the texture of the pillow we put our heads on. How can we know that? We think we know the planet we're floating on in space in. How can we know that? If the retina at the back of your eye can only register certain degrees of light, missing ultraviolet and uh, what is the other one? UV and there's a, it's a massive spectrum. So not only are we in, the, in this section of the spectrum, but within this section we have limitations. But we interact with the world that way, and we think that's the world. And this is the, where the mistake comes from, why things don't work all the time. Because under, thinking that that's reality, our section of the spectrum, means we take action towards those things that are incorrect to start with. So we're going to get back an incorrect result, an incorrect experience. Yeah? Every action has an equal and opposite reaction. So we're going to have some action laden with ignorance of not knowing the spectrum. It starts that way. And then it goes through your senses and the rest and you have contact with the outside world. Yeah? And then, like Sam said, you develop a feeling from that contact. You know, here is the beautiful flower. Yeah? And you're looking at this. You've just made contact. If you've got really good nose, you can probably smell it. It's a beautiful smell for me. You can all see it, right? It's red. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> what color is it? Yes, teacher. <laughs> It's a slightly different shade for each of you, I bet. And you introduce some other being in here, and it's not that shade of yellow, white, beige, whatever you're labeling it already. Yeah? The way this rose exists, according to the highest view of dependent origination, is dependent on your perception. perception. 
Yeah? Now it sounds fuzzy wuzzy, you have to stay with the logic because it, it will explain so many more things as we get deeper into what the hell does that mean and how can it help me remove every hurt? Because there is something about this depends on your projection. Then you have to understand a bit more about causes and effect, karma. You have to understand emptiness, those three key concepts, dependent origination, emptiness and karma. If you get well versed at those, you smash the wheel. What's link one again? Ignorance, Ignorance of what? Where things really come from, right? We don't know. Yeah? We think we know. So if you did not have ignorance, you would interact with every object. And we're using a, a rose, or we use the pen as an example, but don't get stuck on the examples. This talks about, this represents the 20, the 65 things that are happening to you every millisecond. It's not just about a pen or a rose. You have to get those ideas and transplant them instantly to 65 times a second. Can you think cognitively about 65 different things a millisecond? No. You're diving into this experience, forever weaving yourself through this spectrum. Your mind forever changing. Yeah, in, within that spectrum. You feel good one day, you feel bad the next. So back to this. We're getting contact with the object. Look, it changed instantly from a rose to a pen. <laughs> Boo. <laughs> uh, and you develop a feeling about it. I develop a feeling how beautiful. Hmm? And that feeling drives you to do what? You said it. Desire. Yeah. You either desire to come towards it or desire to go away from it, right? It smells absolutely beautiful, right? Imagine with me, you're sniffing this rose. If you've got one, smell it and it smells absolutely beautiful. Try and get that sensation in your head. A dog peed in it. <laughs> <laughs> and your mind instantly goes, I'm not sure about this, um, too close to the rose, yeah? So imagine that something horrible's in there. Some worm, some horrible thing that might come out and disturb you, yeah? And the perception of it changes slightly. It's the same rose. It didn't change, yeah? Your perception changed. You had a different contact with a different idea and your feeling forced you to have a, a different kind of desire for it. For those of you who are stubborn, and uh, there's a statistic in the nominal world that says 80% of people will logically go through a process, while 20% of people doesn't matter what they're told, they're going to try the opposite. Yeah? Um, so if you're the 20%, um, don't think of P in it. So this link 10 is very important, and that's why in Tibetan, um, it, it's important to make sure that the, the body at the point of dying is in a peaceful space, and that the person passing away, if it's you, should try and recall as many of the good experiences and the goodnesses like we did in the meditation before as possible, as genuine as possible. Because the more stable that mind, the more peaceful, the more likelihood is that that would be the type of projecting karma. I mean, they talk about in the book of Living and Dying not to uh, get somebody too cold too quickly after they've passed away because their consciousness is still connected with those selves. Yeah, with the sense powers and so on for up to four to five hours after the moment of death. And so if they get a quick cold sensation, they might want a wish, they'll get a feeling and a desire for warmth. And so if the karmas that are being collected at that time are warmth, they want warmth and warmth and warmth, you know, you know, they say you could end up in a hell room experiencing too much heat. Yeah? And if you're angry, even worse. Well, that intention behind anger, that hatred or whatever, forces you to have that kind of projected life. So, if while you're dying, like, could you have the desire for understanding 
how reality works Absolutely. and that desire would would amplify and amplify into a really, really strong perception of how reality works? You can, yeah. There are practices that you do at death. I don't, I'm not well versed at them, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, that poem, I think it's called, Mike, is it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and, and they let you uh, have that experience mm -hmm. at the moment of death. But it's like playing the lottery, yeah. you know? I mean, there are monks and nuns in monasteries who just practice every night as, I mean, and look, all death is, we'll talk about this, but you, you've all been here, sorry, yeah? Um, it's a shift in perception, yeah? If things exist because they're dependent on your perception, then everything that changes is a shift in your perception. Like we changed a beautiful rose that opened up a lot after I told it it had weed. Um, um, hmm. We'll do the pen quickly, because I want to refresh the idea of emptiness. Actually, before we do that, I want to just talk about the practice of dying. It's a shift in consciousness, yeah? In a shift in your, in your mind, a shift in perception. So, as your mind goes into that lull state that separates from cognitive consciousness, yeah? At death. Then, the mind starts saying, oh my God, I am not that body. And it has a strong desire. It really charges up that that sense. That's why things amplify. Um, and so the grasping tends to be, I really want this body, I really want something, yeah? And then you get into this heightened sense of uh, mind. And so that's why that projecting karma is important. Monks and nuns around the world uh, practice getting to a state where your mind is uh, thinking the right thoughts, engineering the right karmas, in that shift of from life to death. So they practice meditating on dying. They imagine themselves going through that process. Why would you do that for 20, 30 years? It's rehearsal. It's rehearsal, yeah? It is the only certainty we have on this planet other than taxes for some. <laughs> That's not really a certainty, you know? Does anybody know anybody that lives 100 years? I mean, I know a lady 103. People come and comb her hair. She can't remember anything. Her mind is uh, all over the place. She's happy. <laughs> Everything they bring her makes her happy. She's happy. She's going to die soon. 103. Yeah, she sings childhood songs. They comb her long hair and she loves it. <laughs> so in that state, she's in a good place to die. Yeah? She's been compassionate to people. And that's what she's re remembering. Like she really has looked after lots of people. Um, her name's Rosa, which I thought was fun. Yeah. Um, so monks and nuns practice dying. Yeah. Sorry. Um, I have a question about: um, Is it really a bad thing to be projected into the hell realm? Because um, uh, I think that could be a way to quickly burn up a whole bed of bad karmas. Um, <laughs> That's good. <laughs> the, the, it, no, it's a good thinking. It's a good question. Yeah, because. Uh, it's the opposite of the pressure realm, right? If, if you're experiencing lots of goodnesses at the pressure realm and after the goodnesses expire, all you're left with is your old seeds from previous lives that are horrible and therefore you must only experience that badness because all your goodnesses have expired, then it would seem logical to ask the opposite, right? Uh, and I'm glad you asked the question. And obviously I'm stalling because I'm trying to think of an answer, no. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I would think that if you're suffering so badly that all the karma that you'd be creating would be very selfish. Exactly. So yeah. you'd be just spending, and you'd last a long time there, right? So you'd just be spending, like, help us thinking about yourself and your own wallowing and your own suffering. So you'd be burning it up, you'd be planting them, too. Yeah. And, this is, and there's this, the, the, you'll be planting karma there is one answer. The other answer is that this whole realm is a downward spiral. Yeah, it's not like... Uh, it's a total neutral zone. The tendency for things that start with igno ignorance is to have that, I think it's the second law of thermodynamics where complex energy drops to nothing. Yeah? It looks, it dissipates, things break down. Yeah? This idea of downward, that's just the kind of world where you, you can see it with nature. You know? Things turn to crap. You leave things unattended. If, people, if we don't maintain things, they get destroyed by themselves. Yeah? If you eat the most healthy yogurt, the most precious fruit, the best vitamins, 
by yourself your body is going to destroy itself. Yeah? You use the best paper. In this realm, things have a tendency to have that downward spiral. So, from the, help, from the pleasure realms, it makes sense that you would drop down to the hells. But you're still planting karmas in every reaction that you have. And if someone comes and smashes you over the head, your instinct, your desire, quickly before, uh, before you get a chance to, to realize what's happening to you, is to get back at them. I mean, that's our, our tendency here. And we have this beautiful balance between uh, uh, some pleasure every now and then and some suffering every now and then, which is why we, we are said to be at the optimum place to practice these ideas, this dharma. Yeah. So it, it's a good question, but the fact that we're in this realm alone means that, look, that it, things just keep dissipating. You have to run faster than normal running to start catching up the spiral. Yeah? And in fact, that's what uh, the reverse of the, the forward direction of the wheel of life is, is trying to undo that downward motion and turn it into an upward motion, to use that analogy. Yeah? Does that answer at all? So when we are a pleasure, um, pleasure being, yeah. do we, we plant karmas? We don't really create more good karmas. So well, uh, it's just do you remember how we end up at the pleasure realms? Mm. Do you remember? Mm. Meditate in the formless realm of life. Yeah. 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 So you habituate your mind through sort of, um, not, I don't want to say useless meditation yet, yeah, but meditation that uh, that really doesn't have uh, too much virtue in it. Yeah, it doesn't. It's uh, so you might focus on your breathing for 20 years. It's neutral. Yeah, it's like, bleh. but because you're not planting negative karmas, you're you're not harming beings. Yeah, you might have some good intentions as you sit there and go, I'm going to really try and figure things out. But you haven't quite cracked the code, quite tried to figure out exactly how things work. You've just focused on a non-virtuous object, which is your breath or a flame or something. You're going to get some benefits from your intention, but the results of that benefit are still caught up because you haven't cracked the code. Are caught up in this downward spiral, which means all the karmas are ripening and ripening and being used up, and then all you're left with is the stuff from previous lives that, or before you started doing that meditation, that were more vir less virtuous than, than good. I mean, if you had to count today, really, 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 how many of the things you've done were, are going reverse? A good karma, a really, really good karma, um, has four <coughs> parts. Does, it bless you? Does, uh, does anybody remember the four parts of a really well-planted karma? I know I didn't teach it, but it was in the karma class recently. Strong intention. That's part two. Yeah. yeah, the thinking of it, which is 90%, and a big chunk of that thinking about it is strong intention. Mm -hmm. So when you have a strong intention, that guarantees a well-planted karma. If the intention is bad, you're going to get a big bad result. If the intention is good, you're going to get a positive result. What's before that? It's correct identification. Yeah. So you correctly identify that I'm going to, I see in front of me um, a person, her name is Eve, and I'm going to give her a rose because I like her a lot. Yeah? So I've just given Eve a rose. She's a nice girl. Lovely. Yeah? Rose was nice. There goes Eve. She's nice. I had correct identification. She was a girl and she's nice. <laughs> yeah? And my intention was I, I wanted to like me. <laughs> <laughs> Um, is that really good for Eve? <laughs> Gary, be quiet. It'll make her happy. <laughs> she, pr she probably likes flowers. She probably likes flowers. Yeah. She likes the way. But what was my intention? Like to get her to like you. I want her to like me. It's yeah. Selfish. Me, me, me. It's a bit selfish. Yeah. So that's part two of the karma. My motivation. Part three of the karma was. Yeah, you've carried out the action. You've seen yourself, you've recorded yourself giving the, doing the action. You know, I gave her the, the rose and I saw it and it happened. It left my hand, it touched her hand. My mind saw a giving, a passing on. It's going to plant 
an opportunity for a return or coming back. Mm -hmm. From somebody that wants what? Me to like them, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> Most likely. Uh, what was the last one? I have it here. You finish it. Yeah, you see yourself finish it. Yeah, so you do the action and you see yourself finish it. Sorry, I had to jump ahead. So that would be like the difference between like if you were giving Eve a, a flower and then someone knocks on the door and yeah. you get distracted and you talk to them, you still have accumulated some virtue in the process, but not as good. But not the entirety of it because I didn't yeah. see the thing being completed. So you'll maybe someone yeah. will give you like a, a crappier flower. Yeah. So I saw her get the flower, she grabbed it off me and I saw uh, that the action was complete in my mind. She looked at the flower, she smiled, she likes me. Yeah? <laughs> so it's complete. My intention was done. Yeah? Uh, the opposite would be stabbing somebody, you know? Uh, it might be a dark alley or something, and I think it's she. I'm not really going to do it, she. Yeah, and, um, and I think it's she walking there, and so I go and stab the shadow in guy who I think is she looks like she. You know? <laughs> um, but if I didn't actually see him, you know, I stabbed somebody, I, I did the deed, mm -hmm. but if I didn't actually see his face, if I had some tiny bit of doubt in my mind, because as I left, as I left the other way, ran away, I heard cheese giggle somewhere else. <laughs> <I'm> like, oh, <laughs> you know, or he could just be giggling because he's been practicing power, and so at the moment of death, he's like, oh, this is awesome. Yeah, but anyway, that's, that's another story. <laughs> so, <laughs> How come we were talking about karma? Mm -hmm. Because it's an important it's an important thing in the wheel, yeah? It gets charged up with intention. Yeah? And those intentions get more charged up uh, as we die because we're grasping this idea of the, the body is going. Uh, we were talking about it um, for for planting um, Karmas in their hell realms as well. Yeah, I mean those things don't happen consciously; they just happen. Yeah, um, I'm totally lost as opposed to where I wanted to go. One thing we covered is um, remember the idea of layers that I said earlier about you know we're just uncovering a different uh, and all of these layers that we're uncovering have depth to them. The idea of karma you can study that for ten years, five years. And still not fully get it. It's actually one of the most hidden phenomena, they say. But there are some rules. You know, there's the top 10 most horrible things you could do that guarantees you some negative experience. Now, doing some bad towards someone or doing some good towards someone else, is that a. Uh, how, how does that guarantee you a negative experience? Let's take the example of the rose with Eve. And I did just an average karma with her, an everyday karma with her. Just like I wiped my face with a towel in the bathroom. It's all about me, really. You know, it's like, uh, I'm using a bunch of human lives. You know, some people collected cotton in the middle of nowhere, you know, who are struggling at one dollar a day, being shipped over to a Walmart, you know, etc., etc. I don't even think about all the stuff, all the, all the goodness that it took to get that towel into my bathroom. And I grab it and wipe my face. It's, it's a lot of taking today for me, when you look at it in that way, yeah? We are so used to it, we think it's neutral. It's not neutral, it's not normal to have a bunch of cotton weaved into something beautiful that can you know, remove the sweat or the wetness from you at your leisure. It's not a natural thing. It's not a given right. It takes people's lives and breath and effort. In that respect, it's using a bucket load of good karma to have that experience. A bucket load. Just wiping your face in the bathroom, turning the faucet so the water's not brown. Lying on that pillow that we talked about before, as your head goes down to the pillow, we don't think of the goodness that we have. It's not normal, this human experience we're having. You know, I mean, like, 
really nice glass for really good total water. Oh, tonic water. Tonic yeah, water. tonic water. Um, we talked. Mm, we talked about doing uh, an ignorant about the good coma over there. What would the so with those four components, meaning there's the object, the correct identification, there's my thinking about it, which is the intention, and then it's got all these other things. Then there's doing the deed and seeing yourself complete the deed. What would be the best way to do that? Now we're still doing that in the shitty part of the spectrum. We're still doing it with the, this view of the spectrum, ignoring the real way things work. Yeah, we're doing it in this way. So what would be the best karma I could do? The best action I could do towards a being that I experience as lovely. If you think about um, emptiness. Compassion. Mm -hmm. You could have some compassion. Okay. Yeah, that would start rising that feeling. Your motivation gets a little bit more charged up. That would get some really good results. How can you get an ultimately good result? I was gonna, yeah, I was gonna say that you you would, in the correct identification of Eve, you would correctly identify her as a being that dependent on dependent on her loveliness is dependent on all of your past deeds and habituation to even see Eve as you see her, and therefore recognizing her emptiness. Awesome. And then you could, and then the rose you could be giving to her. Everything about the rose you would you would realize is completely dependent on all your past habituation and action to even identify it as a flower. And and all the goodness that comes along with it is all your identification. It's all coming from you. And then you, as the giver, are appearing as Hector, the, the dude. Yeah. Who Blonde. and you're only seeing <laughs> Gorgeous. Uh, oh my god. So pretty. <laughs> and, you're, and you realizing the way you are appearing, how you're feeling in the moment is also enti entirely dependent on your past action and habituation. And all of that. Thrust upon you by your. Yeah. You're thrust upon you by your past deed and habituation. So in that moment, you can remember. That all those all parts of the transaction, the three parts, the three spheres, have no nature of their own, mm -hmm. and they could really be anything. So in that moment, you can be creating causes for everyone's enlightenment by what you're doing. Perfect. So now that's an infinitely good karma. Yeah, you got a bunch of them. By the time L10 comes about, and your the compassion actually, which Mia said, uh, it is a good way to stay in the human realm. Yeah, the more compassionate your thoughts is a good way to stay in this realm. Now, do you stay in this realm? Are you reborn in the human realm after that? Are you reborn in the human realm? Can you be reborn? Can you be reborn? You can take another verse. Can't, yeah, you can't be reborn like we think of reborn in the West, right? Like it's a shift of perception. Yeah, that makes you see yourself having the experience you're having right now. This is uh, a different way of thinking about stuff. It's not going to come easy. You have to hear it many times. Um, so all of a sudden, the giving of a rose has planted the causes for a most magnificent result. The key there was understanding that things don't have a nature of their own. There's a wisdom to that. It opens the eye of L1, of the blind person. It gives sight to the person in link one. Link one is a blind woman with a cane wandering the earth, unaware of her reality, like us. We don't we think this is reality. What we experience is reality. We even think it within the human realm. We think towels are normal. We think pillows are normal. Running water is normal. Yeah? We think uh help Giving roses. <laughs> Giving roses is normal. Having roses. Seeing roses. Absolutely. Yeah? We think this is normal. Just within this realm. Can I backtrack? I yeah? got a little confused um, with Sammy said, but Sammy um, said, if you're giving a rose because you want Eve to like you, mm -hmm. that's not 
planting good karma, isn't it? I mean, you should be giving it to her because you want her to be happy. Correct. That's better karma than wanting her to like me. But well, wouldn't is, wanting her to like you be like grasping? I mean, yeah, that would be yeah. all the negative karma. But how, why do people give uh, roses most of the time? Because they want people to like them. Probably. But also, she got a rose. I saw myself or giving her. Or to make them happy. Yeah. To yeah, make her happy, happy, so she'll like you because you made her happy. Yeah, any of those things. Any of those things. But it wasn't done with wisdom, what I'm saying. No. It was done with a blind woman. Yeah? Right. So we think it's a good karma. But it's not. It's not an ultimately good karma. But it's not like punching. It doesn't get us out. It doesn't get us out of the wheel. It keeps, keeps us in the wheel. Right. Yeah? So it's a, it's a good thought. You can do an infinite level up. I just throw her a rose because her ex gave her a rose and I want her to be my girlfriend. I still gave her a rose. I still see myself giving her a rose. It's better than not giving her a rose and it's better than throwing rocks at her. But it depends, <laughs> on, and it, but it depends on, my, on my intention. The intention is what will come back. What if he really loves rock? <laughs> okay, <like rocks. laughs> You've got to say it. Oh, I, um, I, I have asked that question before, and I've gotten the direction that was a little different. Um, I guess that the Dalai Lama said that the, he did Did he give you a different answer? Well, the direct, what would he the, the, I was told that that's what the Dalai Lama said, <laughs> okay, so I didn't, good. yeah, I didn't get, I got the answer through someone else. But um, they said that it was a Western idea to feel that you shouldn't have a reward for what you give. That um, it's intelligence and self-interest to yep. expect the give and take. Yep. Yeah. Um, so it's okay yeah. to yep. want something in return for a gift. But what does he want? What does he want? In, no, but what does he want in return for giving? What you does shouldn't want anything if you're for really good karma. No, 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 no. You want to, you, I want you, enlightenment yeah. as fast as possible. Well, enlightenment, yeah. yeah. You shouldn't want, like, expect Eve to like you. Well, then right. there's, well, what he's done is, like, made me happy, and then if he knows that he'll be happy in return, he's just doubled the amount of happiness in the room. Oh, that's, yeah, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that will happen. Yeah. But I was, I was using it to, to highlight that it's an, an okay karma versus a great karma. Yeah. Oh, but but I, I, my understanding is that like asceticism or um, becoming a martyr is not the goal, and that doesn't Def actually definitely bring not. anybody closer no. to anything. But we said that on yeah. uh, class one. Mm -hmm. Remember, we said the Buddha and everybody on the path wants something. They just don't want it with the pig and driving the want. They want, I mean, a, a Buddha in a Buddha paradise, which is the ultimate result of all these actions, sits there wanting for suffering to end. That's a wanting, yeah? Mm. They understand that it's in their perception, in their self perception, yeah? Which self? They also understand mm. that there is no self separate to the one that they're perceiving, yeah? In that, in, and that's where the, my understanding of the Western idea of self and selflessness gets mixed up. There's no self. There's no self existence. There's, you know? So, I, I agree, and I, I don't think it, um, maybe I said it wrong or something. Yeah? When I was answering. The, uh, I, I just asked another one of my teachers about about enlightened self interest and like the difference between that and self aggrandizement, which yeah. would be like, I want. Like self aggrandizement would be like I'm giving this to you because I want you to like me. That's from like you're you're going from like tiny relative you. You know, when you're doing that. You're going from like the ego with that little e. The one that still thinks that it's self existent. Yeah. yeah. The one that thinks it's like, you know, Sam always was Sam, always gonna be Sam. I'm hopping from life to life at Sam, like and <laughs> <laughs> And the, uh, but then the, the enlightened self-interest when you're performing that action knowing that you're going to get a good result is um, from that, that part that does not, from the perception that, that does not really see a separation between you and I. So, did that do anything? Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Um, before we finish on karma in five minutes, because we're talking about karma, I. Uh, there is, uh, you can plant really, really good karmas, intelligent karmas that understand the ultimate nature of things. When you do that, you can get, uh, you can get closer to experiencing the bigger spectrum. 
and when you when you do that, then you know the correct action to do in the spectrum to get 100% of a result. That's the simplest way I can put that. Yeah, um, you can guess that there's eight more bandages to come off by having a logical understanding of where things come from, dependent on my perception. So you you understand and study dependent origination more. You might understand that there's eight more layers of gauze that needs to be removed from your eyes, but you're only up to layer two, but because you've removed a layer or two of understanding that the way we think things work isn't, in fact, the full thing, when you get that sense, you know that there's maybe eight layers left. And so with, uh, with that logical faith, yeah, with that understanding, then you can do some correct action, hoping for the best, but with intelligent information in your head which will drive you to remove the next layer and the next layer and the next layer. You're only going to learn the path, the graduated path, we talked about that last night, uh, gradually, <laughs> in stages. There's no way that today we can walk out of here and have a perception of the towel and the faucet and the pillow and the sheets and, and all these things and think about them coming from our own projections forced upon us by our past karma because things don't have a nature of their own because if they did, everybody would see them in exactly the same way. We can use those words and understand them, but there's no way unless you are not the people that are um, thinking that you are or um, experiencing that you are, unless you're not those, uh, it's not normal in this downward spiral realm to understand that it's a bigger place. Similarly, when we talked about there is no penness coming from this thing and a dog will pop in here and see a chewable toy, for you to believe me that the ultimate nature of reality isn't self-existent, that you can stop aging and you can stop death, like this says, would be asking a dog to sit on this seat and convince a bunch of other dogs to say it's not a chewable toy, it's a pen. And then all these dogs are looking at this thing going, it's no pen, God. It's a chewable toy. Yeah? No. They say you could write with them. Now, I've heard. I'm a wise dog. Yeah? I used to hang around with the Dalai Lama, and I've heard him say, I've got an impression that if he does something, I can write with him. If I do that, I can write with him with my paw and have my dog girlfriend come and take a rose from me. You know? But then all the other dogs, because of, because of the realm of experience that their mind is forcing upon them, they don't have a choice but to see it as a durable toy. So for me to sit here and tell you, it's possible, because we have the understanding that we do, the teachings that we have, it's possible, if this isn't a rose from its own side, a beautiful thing from its own side, that we're experiencing it that way through our narrow field of vision. If we saw the entire spectrum of this really was what's emanating from this thing, if we saw the entire possibility of views upon this object and not just our own narrow field, if that's true, yeah, then, and we know that to be true because when a dog walks in here, he does not see a beautiful rose he might smell it and want to pee because <laughs> it's green, you know, or a cat will want to chew it or spray it. It's not a beautiful rose to give Eve. And it's not a choice for them and it's not a choice for you and it's not a choice for them not to see this as a pen. They are forced to see it as a pen. And then we deviate a little bit that humans are forced to see this this way. And we can bring an Eskimo who's never seen a pen, but within a few weeks we can teach them and they'll know it's a pen. That's the realms, a human realm and animal realm. The propensity to understand things within that part of the spectrum that will never bump and be understood, no matter how much I force a dog to say it's a pen, will he ever get it like the Eskimo did. That's the difference to have a mind projecting animal realm. Because it's the same place, guys and girls. There is no realm out there that's an animal realm. It's in this room. You're forced to see this this way. So back to the dog. 
me telling you because of logical explanations over 2,500 years of people that have had a hint of the spectrum. In fact, in the experience of emptiness, you have a direct perception of the entire spectrum. And whether you believe it or not, you get to see your past and future lives and a whole bunch of other stuff that you come back and then have the experience of the four aerial truths. Yeah, it's that. It's like me, te me telling you this, that death can stop. You can't believe it. There's part of you that says, no, it sounds crazy. Don't be silly. There's a part of you that doesn't believe it. Like a dog not seeing this as a pen. This is a pen. Or is it a chewable toy? It can't be both. It's a thing in the spectrum. It's dependent on the, the being perce perceiving it. Can they have a choice to see it as a pen? Not the dog. Can you have a choice? Can I force you to see it? To Whenever you see this, you get an instinct to pee. Can I force that on you? I, mean, I can probably have betrayed you through public yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> It's the wrong choice. <laughs> Don't pee yeah. <laughs> when you see the next rose. Do you get that? Yeah. This explanation is radical. It's radical. This amount of beings on the planet spent time thinking about it. And yet the logic is sound. If you believe the pen, you must believe that every single part, atom, that you're experiencing as you turn your head and you see that wall, as you feel the sensation of the air from the fan on top of you, all of that is forced upon you. The goodness, the badness, the pleasure, the functionality of it does not come from those things. It never did. You created them through actions towards others. That's why compassion, goodness towards others works. They're good karmas. You see yourself doing some goodness. That's why the three spheres or we taking actions with wisdom works ultimately. It gets you to the entire spectrum. Yeah? Now, can you have a break and then we'll come back and do I want to do the verse at the bottom. Actually, don't have a break. I need to quickly tell you. Most of the time we're doing uh, ignorant karmas. Yeah? Thinking the goodness of it comes from inside. The towel doesn't matter too much. The pillow doesn't matter too much. You need to learn how to short circuit or destroy bad karma. So when Link 10 pops up for you, you can... Um, you can have destroyed any large amounts of negativity you've done in your life by doing this practice uh, called the four forces, which can, it's said to, let's say, um, if you have a really bad karma, you've hurt somebody deeply, you've, uh, you've killed beings, or you've done any of the 10 non-virtues, they've said, you know, you've, um, the 10 big yuckies that you could do in life. If you've done any of those in any part of your life, it's important for you to know that you can short circuit the result of that karma through the four forces. It's a purification exercise that Buddhists do around the world, monks and nuns do every two weeks. And in fact, the beginning of that purification, the confession part of that, they recite the first verse at the bottom of the wheel of life every two weeks around the world. So the four forces um, are the foundation force, which is what? Anyone know? Taking refuge. Taking refuge in the thing that can really help you. Yeah? Refuge meaning if you understand reality correctly, that can really help you. Thinking that giving roses comes from working hard and earning money and getting roses, you know, uh, going shopping and getting a rose doesn't really help you. Knowing that I could ever experience a rose as a goodness because I've, ever, I've done goodnesses towards others with shapes that look like roses, knowing the emptiness of the rose, knowing that there is no nature from its own side, is the foundation force. That can really help you. Because if things are blank, then you can... Um, we don't have time. The destruction force. You think of that negative thing that you've done. You've hurt somebody. 
you were in their shoe, would it have felt correct? You know, uh, you've harmed some beings, psychologically, physically, whatever. You think about that, what it's like, and you build that sense of regret like we did at the beginning of the meditation. That's part two. That genuine sense of regret, meaning um, I just did something. I did something for a while that wasn't clever. Because that deed will come back to you. You've harmed yourself infinitely and it will grow as the karma plants. It could be one of the linked tens. So you generate an understanding of the empty nature of things. If things are empty and then they're forced upon you by your past karma, then this karma is coming back. That should give you regret. Like thinking you're having a sip of soda. That's poison. And as soon as you <laughs> swallowed, you thought it's poison. As soon as you swallowed. I can't I can spew it out, whatever, but I've got poison in me. It's the same feeling. You wish you hadn't. And then, the restraint force. This is probably the one that works things, <laughs> makes things work, mm -hmm. which is, you promise not to do that again. <laughs> if it's lying to people constantly, I mean, and each of us have three big ones, or four big ones, or a few big ones, you know, that are our habits. They're the ones that need to be purified regularly. That's why monks and nuns get together every two weeks. They're trying to keep all those karmas clean. So whatever it is for you, lying, coveting, stealing, I mean, whatever the negative emotion that, if it were turned around, there were people around you were feeling that towards you, whatever that is, and if it feels harmful, stop. Stop. Put some goodness in the world. So stop hurting you. If everything is forced upon you by your perception, all that stuff is you. Well, the, remember the last thing we did last week was the boundary of you was here and then instantly it was out there? You're everyone. You're everything. Don't hurt yourself. So stop. Make a commitment to not do that again. Actively seek to do it. Choose one thing. Yeah. And then um, try and mend the, the thing you did. And that was called the antidote. So if you've taken life, do the opposite. Take care of someone or something or some being that is special for you. And tend for it, care for it. Make its life precious. Make it your business that their life is precious until they pass naturally. Yeah? If it's stealing, coveting, do the opposite. If it's being happy that people split up, if it's being happy when bad things happen to other people, do the opposite. Look for people that good things happen to. Imagine the happiness they feel and grow that. Or go secretly. This is the fun part of Buddhism. The antidote part. Go secretly without anybody knowing because this is your karma planted in your mind for you secretly go and do some goodness that you know will make somebody happy to undo some badness that you've done for you. Some precious thing. Nobody knows. And there's some incredible bodhisattvas. Bodhisattvas is a long word for bloody do gooder. Yeah? <laughs> and there's some wonderful bodhisattvas in the world being very secretive and leaving things in places and giving things to people and planting little bombs around that explode with niceness for people. So they're very important things, those four forces. Now you can have a break, sorry, and we'll come back shortly. Good things. Yeah, I did. I'm the queen. You're the flower. <laughs> 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 
for my chance to use an editor of forcing me to see you in Paris editor. That's weird. Yeah, really my god, it is so crazy. <laughs> Um, what we're going to do, and I'm just going to hand out this night, we're going to do some of the things that we need to make sure we cut them into it. So people have these, so that we can get them all together. If you can get me a pair of scissors, I'll do one now. And you've got a choice whether you want one with a skull to remind you of this or Is without a skull. Yeah, no, it's plastic. I think. Oh, how nice! Yes, it is. Oh. I, I understand it, yeah. but I just thought the word of it is. Thank you. Check this out. Awesome. Mm -hmm. All right, over. Huh? Did you make these? There you go. That's the picture, huh? How nice is that?